Um, I'm a farmer um, near Mullaney in southeast Queensland. I just wanted to spend 30 seconds or so talking about APSA before I hand over to the, the main event tonight. Um, the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance is a membership-based organisation that fights for the right to have nutritious, culturally appropriate food and the right to design a food system that suits us. Um, it's really important work that we do as AFSA, uh, supporting eaters, supporting farmers, lobbying government, making change. And the only way we can do that, the only way we can provide um, you know, interesting sessions like today is through our strong membership. So we've had huge membership growth in the last year or so, which has been really wonderful. If you're not yet an AFSA member, please check out our website. We would encourage you to join, um, particularly if you're a farmer joining in today, there are really significant benefits in, um, in having the solidarity of an organisation like AFSA. So I'd encourage you all to drop what country um, you're Zooming in from uh, in the chat. Uh, I can see a few people are doing that already. I also just wanted to give everyone a disclaimer that uh, we are recording this session uh, for future access. So, um, so hopefully that is all right with anyone, uh, with everyone. What I'm going to do first is hand over to Tyson Yunkaporta to introduce himself briefly. Then we'll uh, hear from Tammy Jonas about uh, the context of the session today. So Tyson, I'll hand over to you, mate. Hey, how are you all doing? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, not that much of a farmer, actually, I've got to tell you. So I hope I've got something useful to tell you today. Um, yeah, I'm talking to you from um, Bunurong country. Um, yeah, I've got this sort of small rental property, but there's enough like little bits of dirt. I mean, it's not like living dirt, it's like dead dirt, but there's a few bits of dirt out in the yard there that I've been, you know, you know how you get evicted and then you start in a new place and then you spend six months already bringing their soil back to life for them and then they kick you out and you go to the next place. And, you know. So I'm just doing, going through that right now. Um, <laughs> doing the next part that you, as you do. Um, yeah, well, it's really good to see you all. Um, I'm from 3,000 kilometres uh, north of here. That's where my family stay there at um, Western Cape York. Uh, I belong to the Uplitch clan. Um, I've got kin and cultural and ancestral connections all over, you know, in a few places down here in the south and, and um, out in the west too. Um, yeah, I'm a kind of a bit of a mongrel <laughs> from whichever way you look at things. And um, I don't know, there's a few interesting uh, hybrid insights that can sort of drop out of a, a marginal person like that from time to time if he's still listening. So I hope to listen closely to you today and um, and we'll see what we can back and forth, what kind of friction comes out of there. Yeah. That's wonderful, mate. Thank you. No worries. Um, Tammy, I'll hand over to you. Um, introduce yourself and uh, and talk a bit about the uh, the context of our session today. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone, and particularly um, welcome to Tyson to joining a solidarity session with AFSA. It's really a pleasure for all of us to have you here. Um, I'm a, for those who don't know, I'm a small scale farmer myself on the lands of the Jajawarung in the central highlands of Victoria. And uh, also the president of AFSA for too long, actually probably shouldn't have been here as long as I have been. If anyone wants to put their hand up for the role, let us know, we're, we're on the lookout. <laughs> and, um, and the context here is AFSA, the food sovereignty movement globally is probably many people, or maybe you don't know, uh, it actually starts and, and ends, I guess, with Indigenous peoples and, and peasants of the world. And in our international work, AFSA has done a lot of work with Indigenous uh, peoples. But in Australia, while we have been making efforts to work on decolonizing our, our food sovereignty activism and showing greater solidarity with Indigenous movements, I feel like we have not been very effective or as active as we could be for the for many years and it's it's not for lack of care but it has been um often a lack of of certainty of how to proceed and i think in the last year we've made much better strides in in the actions that we're taking on my farm as well as with afsa we now pay the rent um as does afsa to a we choose different organizations to pay the rent directly to now because we think sorry is not enough um and uh, in our case, we pay on the farm, we pay the rent to the pay the rent organization here in Victoria. Um, 
I guess when I read Tyson's book, because, uh, which I read for a number of reasons, one is also because in my PhD that I started last year, I'm interested in how in an agroecological transition in Australia, we can, um, as agroecological farmers, we can contribute to decolonizing work um, across Australia. And to do that, obviously, we need to learn from Indigenous epistemologies, Indigenous ways of being in the world and thinking in the world. And that's what, of course, Tyson has written about in Sand Talk and talks very well about. And a lot of um, your work, Tyson, has, has um, spoken to concerns we've grappled with around capitalist food systems and um, lack of connectivity to food systems. And so we already have, I think, alignments as peasants, it, which we a phrase that those of us in the movement use in solidarity with the peasants of the world, acknowledging that we don't have a long history of peasantry in the country, in this country. Um, but we think there are a lot of commonalities and I found your book really enriching in that way. But it also, as you said in a webinar I listened to with Stonington, that there are things in the book that will change your DNA. And I feel like that that happened to me when I read this book, so thank you. Um, and I'm going to ask you an opening question, I guess. A lot of our members, but not all of them, are small scale farmers and are working towards caring for a country in ways that are more meaningful and sensitive to the ecosystems of which we're part rather than having mastery over. We identify very strongly with these notions of custodianship um, and yet we're finding our way. And I think we still come from a, a culture and discourse of, of mastery and, and are having to unlearn those cultures. Um, and at the same time, we own land in many cases that is unceded land. And so we struggle with the question of how, how can we work towards indigenous sovereignty while owning unceded land? Um, so those are pretty important starting points for us. And three years ago, I had a conversation with Bruce Pascoe as, at the Food Sovereignty Convergence um, in which he, he used a phrase that he's used elsewhere as well. Um, Black people aren't going anywhere. White people aren't going anywhere. What are we gonna do about it? And that's the starting point for me right now is, so what are your thoughts? Like, what are we going to do about it? And for those of us who are, are non-Indigenous and really want to work on this, what advice have you got for us today? And that's only a starting point. And it's a small one, so off you go, you know. <laughs> the world's changed too much for the old simple solutions. You remember in the good old days, we used to just answer that question with, oh, we'll just keep shagging each other until we're all the same color. And like, that'll be fine, then everything will be good. But I mean, you know, we pretty much are now. And, um, <laughs> you know, half the black fellas you see are like, you know, don't have really dark skin. And, and, and then half the settlers are from other places in the world. And, you know, where there's a bit of melanin kicking around and, you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, like I say in the, in the book, half, my, half of my mob can't scrape together enough melanin to scare off a taxi anymore. So, but, it's they're still there you know we're we're still in the same caste system you know we're still in the same caste system and i think your central question around land especially you as sort of people who are land holders at the moment um, to figure out what exactly it is that you're holding and what that title is and then what it does and then what you can do. I guess that's the big question, you know? Um, so I don't know, what, uh, what, what do you think that is, that land that, you, that you're holding? Because you do, you do have a title. Yeah, yeah, we do. You, you hold a title, like a freehold title on that, of, yeah. of what exactly? See, this is really interesting. Um, it was only a few centuries ago that, um, See, basically, even under the original British mercantile capitalism, you, you could never have your land seized legally, you know, um, in like uh, foreclosing on a debt. Nobody could take your land, you know, originally. They just invented that stupid little loophole of the mortgage. They invented that to trick uh, Native Americans out of their reservation, out of their treaty lands, <laughs> the reservation lands under treaties. You know, so they get them to sign a document, you know, and say, well, we're giving you some tomahawks here. We just want you to put an X on this piece of paper there. And, you know, so then they come back in six months and say, well, you owe us interest. And they're like, what's interest? So they're like, well, then we foreclose on your land and <laughs> off you go. So it was just a trick to get Indian land back. 
And so they, and it was so successful, they started doing it everywhere. And they thought, you know, as with all disgusting policy against indigenous people, against peasantry, serfs, everybody on the planet, um, as with all mistreatment and genocidal policy, it doesn't stay with the, you know, original people that it's guinea pigged on. That's just a trial. They're just trialing all of these terrible policies that we call racist. It's worse than racist people. They're just trialing these things on us because every single one of them, when they get it right, they move it across to all of you from welfare reform to everything, you know, and basically they just keep ramping it up and ramping that up until, you know, all the people in all the castes on at least the bottom 50%, even in a lucky country like this one, you know, uh, everybody's copying that. And more and more, it's about squeezing, it's about wealth transfer. But anyway, this particular mechanism, um, they actually ended up with a few technologies and a lot of it was around cartography. So they basically mapped the entire wor world on a grid, a grid system using a, a certain, uh, these weird instruments. Um, so when the entire, you know, um, surface of the planet was divided up into these enclosures and it's important that they be enclosures and enclosed so that every square of land, you know, was an enclosure that was cut off from the others. So there's basically, and that was the way it was treated, you know, so that there couldn't be a free flow of energy, information, matter, resources, you know, in the complex dynamic system of a bioregion anymore, you didn't have that. You had parcels of land that were enclosed and altered and, um, you know, and so they did wreck the land. But worst of all, it, it put this financial layer over the landscape and over all of our lives. So what is it that you're holding there? What you're holding is capital. And well, what do you think the majority of capital is on the planet? What kind of thing is it? What category of wealth is the majority of capital on the planet? It'd be mineral resources, wouldn't it? It'd be what? Mineral resources, like uh, mineral resources. Um, you think it's maybe bonds or the stock market or derivatives and all this sort of stuff. No, still, even today, two thirds of all the global capital is land. So if you hold land, you hold a very, very uh, shrinking sort of capital mm. asset, you know? Now that, that's something, what you're supposed to do with capital is borrow against it. So they try with most farmers in most countries, they try to put market pressures and supply chain pressures and um, they just tweak the prices just enough so that you have to keep being in debt because they need every single tiny bit of capital, especially land as capital, they need people borrowing against it because that's what creates the size of the economy, which is mostly debt in the end. So you think about how disruptive it would be if you decided somehow collectively, this land that we hold is not capital anymore. It's like, I'm not like giving up my wealth and just giving it away in a big progressive bleeding heart gesture of reconciliation. I'm actually disrupting a global financial system that is destroying the world. How can we collectively, creatively disrupt that system by trying to reimagine what our land is? What if you came up with another way? I don't know what it is because I'm not here to give people answers, but this is a good question. What if your land was not capital? Yeah. And what if you all agreed on that and you informed the world of that? Uh, you would still have the right to enjoy it and to be upon it and to, um, you know, have a really big say in <laughs> whether someone was allowed to come in there and wreck it or not. Um, you know what I mean? And yeah, yeah. you would feel like, yeah, this is my place. Like I belong to this place and I belong here. And, um, and so do a lot of other people. I mean, how exciting would that be? <laughs> yeah, I'm familiar with, um, so I know there's a, a farm up outside of Canberra. Um, I think it's Millpost Farm who have uh, created basically an opportunity with their local mob 
to have an have open access to the property mm -hmm. so that they can come and walk country and perform ceremony and um, continue with some traditional ways. And that's been that's been their way of making that land available to everyone, not only themselves. Yeah, yeah. But as I understand it, they still own it. I don't know if it's in trust or like mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the ownership model is. But. That's really exciting. But I mean, you you will want to have things sorted out before you just throw into that. You know, if you suddenly decide that you're going to make um, your land uh, a commons, if you're going to start doing that, then you probably want to look into the commons thing a bit and you want to look into the issue of multipolar traps and, um, <laughs> you know, uh, self-terminating algorithms of, you know, which is the tragedy of the commons. It's like you really just need one idiot um, to do something and then everybody has to start doing it and then it's a race to the bottom. So this is always a problem. You know, and it's something you need to look into and figure out what sort of mechanisms you're going to have in place. Yeah. Uh, now, if you actually have a really responsible, um, uh, like community organization, uh, Aboriginal organization that is still operating under Aboriginal law and the law of the land and, and the right, um, you know, those laws that prevent people from overstepping, overreaching, you know, um, you know, individually putting themselves ahead of everyone else and all that kind of thing. If, if those laws are properly in place, then, um, then that, that's a really good one to go with. Yeah. Uh, but you want to make sure that's really there, you know, um, sometimes it isn't, or sometimes it's like, you know, it's, um, just sort of resting for a bit <laughs> while yeah. someone experience experiments with embezzlement or, you know, <laughs> a few different <laughs> ideas. <laughs> Which, why not? You know, Jesus, 200 years. I mean, just give us a minute, a little bit of embezzlement. Yeah, that's right. You can have your minute. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, uh, one of the other things that, that I've heard you say and that you talk about in Sand Talk um, is like that the globally, you know, people want to talk about Indigenous knowledges and, and there's a lot of theory about it. There's protection of tra traditional knowledges through things like the um, treaty, plant treaty and... Um, you know, free prior informed consent. We have all these these things, whether or not they're implemented is another matter, but we have talk about it. But you often point out that we don't work on the how. And mm. and I think that for the small scale farmers in our movement and also the allies who aren't farmers, that question of how to be better custodians of land in the cases where we, where we are on land, um, the how is something that a lot of us are, are working our way towards. Mm -hmm. I think certainly for me, I, I, the thinking and, and listening I've done for a number of years helps me think about any species and watching and observing and smelling and you know, mm. paying to what's happening and treating land in, in this way. So I guess yeah. something interesting you thought on. Um, well, you know, look, there's that how is process and and yes you do have your personal like individual process of how you're going to connect and relate and you know start to come into um connection and relation you know with your place and every, all the entities in it and all the people you know in it and um you know become one with that web of relations because really that's where your consciousness is it's in your awareness and everything else uh, your intelligence um, your cognition where that's occurring. It's not just all inside your brain and body, you know, you know, your mind spreads out through that web of relations. And so when you start to understand that kind of haptic thing you're living in, that's beautiful. And so that's that individual level still low, mm -hmm. you know, then it comes out, you know, wider, it comes out to the sort of br broader bioregion, you know, communities and, and all the rest. And then it needs to go out, you know, further than that into everything and it's um it is a very, very tricky process <laughs> to sort of start to develop that and increasing awareness that's going out i think jewish people have got a very similar you know with their idea of um tikkun olam i had that demonstrated to me with three circles once which was interesting to me because it was like a you know an image for me of like a sacred site or a water hole or something like that camp it's a few different things but so that's that three concentric circles and they showed it like that you know you've got to heal yourself and develop yourself then you've got to sort out your family and community and then you sort out the world um, and you go out into that 
Now it's the big picture stuff that's the problem. That's the tricky stuff. Because people see things like, okay, well, you know, there's injustice, there's inequity. So, you know, and it's systemic because people have bad attitudes. So we're going to change everyone's attitudes. And we're going to legislate, we're going to make policy so that people aren't allowed to have those attitudes anymore and everything will be equal and fair. Um, but that's not what structural, that's not where the structural inequality is coming from. You know, it's coming from a growth based economic system that demands, it demands inequality. It needs inequality or they can't be growth and nothing can be priced because yep. nothing can be priced unless it's, unless it's limitable and excludable. And if you know what this means in your first chapter of any economics textbook, the economic problem, demand must exceed supply. You've got to have more people needing the basic things they need to survive than, than are actually receiving it. And that amount of people needs to be growing every year. So you need to have a caste system and whoever you choose, it doesn't really matter. You know, you, but you always have to have at least half of the population, you know, um, laboring under that, that uh, in, inequality. And you can have individuals, you know, being socially mobile, sure. Even families, you know, across those, you, know, you see, anyone can do it. You know, pull up your bootstraps. Um, Etc. <laughs> so, you know, people, I don't know. I just, I think most people don't really see, you know, the pattern and, and what, you know, the actual um, mechanisms that create inequality, you know. So a lot of the problem that you articulated at the start between, you know, settlers existing and, you know, I mean, basically the, settle, so the settler and the settled are going to be here for a good while, so uh, how are we going to sort that out? That big question, you know, um, that needs to go more, and there needs to be more than treaties and voices to parliament and things like this. These are mechanisms that are largely symbolic. In the end, though, that bad relation, you know, between the settlers and the settled, but the occupiers and the occupied, that's got to continue until the land ceases to be capital. And I mean, basically, I don't know, do you want to go hungry for the next 10 years? That's the other thing. Because you're going to have to, I mean, food sovereignty is a really good idea. So please do get your veggies growing. <laughs> but, you know, do you want to not have access to this laptop here, you know, for a decade? Do you want to be in like absolute third world misery and poverty for the next 10 years? Because that big global depression is sort of about to start biting soon. And, you know, how did Australia get out of the last, uh, out of the GFC? You know, we, Australia was ahead of all, the entire world. It was the only country that didn't land on its ass and have a really tough decade. Um, and simply because Australia, I, I know that well, there was always economic stimulus, but that was really just at the start. What carried Australia through, and all the economists recognise this, is that extraction was increased. Mm -hmm. um, exponentially in that time extraction uh, the ore extraction increased and it was lucky enough to be a bit of a price hike in the ore as well so that's how australia got through was by increasing depredations on aboriginal land and aboriginal communities increasing extraction it is how australia is going to get through the next part um, initially under this particular government mostly with uh, natural gas lots and lots of fracking uh, <laughs> lots of big gas plants and everything else, um, all on Aboriginal land, um, all destroying Aboriginal land, all extracting from Aboriginal land, and also needing to implement very uh, heinous uh, policies of control in remote Aboriginal communities, uh, which will include modified curriculums in schools, uh, ramping up welfare reforms, probably having to bring in the Racial Discrimination Act, you know, from something that we like, um, you know, there'll have to be, I don't know, another media campaign about Aboriginal domestic violence or something, um, and a whole of propaganda around that. So when you start seeing that, you know that that'll be coming in and uh, everything will be changing. So basically, I don't know, like, do you want your civilization to continue? That's another question you have to ask yourself because without destroying us, you're not going to be able to keep having this, this computer here. Where do you think the rare earth metals are going to come from for this computer and for the solar panels for your clean energy, allegedly clean energy, you know, 
the rare earth metals can't come from Mongolia and China anymore because they're, they're cutting production back. Those mines are being op opened up on Aboriginal land right here and the refineries and everything else. That also means they'll have to store the radioactive waste because you do get radioactive waste from processing those rare earth metals. They, they'll have to be stored on Aboriginal land as well. Um, Aboriginal communities are going to have to be pretty much destroyed over the next 10 years in order for you to be able to continue having Zoom meetings like this. So there's, you know, on the one hand, there's that, well, what kind of nice things can we do uh, to feel better about that? And just, mm, if we can just stop this racism, that'll, that'll sort it out, you know? But the racism is a symptom of this bigger problem. The racism is a function of this economy. You know, the racism is not the cause of the inequality. The inequality is a function of this system and the racism is, um, you know, basically used to make it all work. Yes. Um, so one of the things that after, I mean, we're 10 years old last year as an organization. Yeah. And, um, and one of the things that we've explicitly done over our time is, is a mixture of working for and while also fighting against, but probably focus the majority of our efforts in the working for, hence things like support for the small scale agriculture um, movement for agroecology in Australia. Mm. But we still fight against, you know, industrial food systems and extractive industries. And one thing we've identified, um, and I've heard you talk about the problems of extractivism to salvage an economy that should be binned anyway. Um, and we think that showing greater solidarity with the movements against the extractive industries is probably one of the important things we need to do in our in our against work. And we want the next solidarity session to be with Lock the Gate and possibly um, maybe the folks at ActionAid as well, who do a lot of global work against mining um, and particularly about the impact on women and uh, agriculture and fisheries and mining. Um, so yeah, I think that that work, as you say, it's like systemic work that has to be done and it has to be, we have to, mining has to stop. Like on, no, it's it's not just the economy, it's, it's um, uh, propping up, which is propping up racism and, and inequality. Um, it's, you know, destroying our, our climate and our very ability to continue to live here. So like anybody's ability to live here. So I think it's an all rounder for something to fight against. You know, it's got very few redeeming qualities except these laptops, as you point out. And so we're going to have to find other means of, of communicating if it's going to require the extraction of those minerals to keep us going. Um, but these are big hard ones. Hey, Tyson, like, how are we going to, how are we going to stop the mining industries? Um, so yeah. not the well, only way we're going we've got any chance it's here's the thing you you, you can you can only operate within your sphere of influence if you want to still have any influence <laughs> you can't really look too far beyond it but at the same time you have to be aware systemically of 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 where everything's coming from yeah. that way when you're doing your local solutions you're actually putting your efforts towards something that reflects reality you know, because if you think that all of this um, uh, economic inequality is coming from people's attitudes, and that if you can just change their attitudes, you'll change the condition. You know, if that's your theory of existence, then you're going to be putting all your beautiful energy and love into the wrong places. Yeah. You know. And, yeah, we. we you know, and you'll have oh, you'll have victories. You know, there'll be black and white handshakes. There'll be fucking hugs. There'll be. Oh, after parties, it'll be great. It'll be awesome. But it's um wrong way, you know, like wrong story. Like <laughs> nothing's going to happen. Same as always, you know. So you, um, so you look out, you know, systemically to the real and you find that pattern, you know, the big pattern of what's really going on. And then you find like, where's my little butterfly effect wings that I can flap down here? Where would be the best place, the most effective place to be a stranger tractor in this complex dynamic system and just twink there and like just watch it all domino <laughs> yeah yeah and that actually reminds me you talk a lot about metaphor and the role of metaphor in indigenous mm -hmm. societies and aboriginal thinking and and obviously you know in in aboriginal cultures you've got millennia of generations to have built these metaphors and ways of thinking together um, or on your own um, that have come from very, very long cultures. And as you call us, you know, us new cultures don't so much have that. Um, and and many of us are not on land that we've been from, you know, we're, we're in new places. Yeah. So 
I'm really interested because you talk about the need to develop metaphor carefully and consciously um, and, you know, with a lot of thought because the metaphors are going to be such an important part of helping us find our way together, I guess, is, is part of what it what it does. Um, yes. Have you got any thoughts on how those who don't have those long linkages mm. uh, when trying to build a collective consciousness and the metaphors to, to drive a movement? Well, well look, I, I, I just, I really do think that, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a wrong idea. And I don't want to like insult anybody who really strongly feels the other way from what I'm saying. So please feel free to disagree. And like, don't take me saying it as like, you know, it's the end of the bloody world because you think something different. Um, anyone starts yelling at me about this, I'll, I'm going to, I'll start yelling back. Um, but you know, you pretty civil in these sessions. I'm yeah. Really look, you know, we're not this culture, uh, the idea that we're a stone age culture that remained frozen in time because we were, you know, um, sort of just wandering around and happened to go get flooded in on, onto an island and just, uh, uh, and then just all go bug it around forever. And that we have exactly the same culture and language and it never changed a goddamn thing. And every ceremony that we do is like 80,000 years old. It's crap. You know, we have a really strong iterative cyclic culture that's constantly in a state of inquiry that's constantly i mean the one thing like really important thing from my book for the elders really wanted everyone to know is that big lesson if you don't move with the land the land will move you you know because the landscape is constantly moving ask any biologist ecologist hey how far does an ecosystem move every year like a couple of hundred meters bras you know, ecosystems move. You can't just fence off this area and call it a national park. And that's right now there. That's where we're going to have the culture and the, and the nature. Um, yeah, that can just stop there. It needs to be moving. You know, like systems need to be exchanging all of the time, energy and information. Uh, systems also need to dump entropy pretty regularly. It's like taking a crap, you know. But luckily, you know, I don't know. Um, <laughs> any system's entropy is another system's lunch if you know what i mean you know so we're constantly cycling that around and, and it's got to go through all these healthy interconnected systems um and that's the way it has to go um so this idea that there's this static culture from a static landscape that was unchanging unchanging landscape for thousands of years and ooga boogers running around with rocks and sticks Bones through the nose, standing on one leg until we arrived and found them there. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, ah. Oh. So the <laughs> idea, the idea that our metaphors are better than yours because they're older, that's bullshit. I mean, the system that we have and the processes in culture for generating metaphors and generating right story that's in response to the real reality of what's actually happening in front of us you know, um, and what's occurring in the system, the big system in which, you know, nature, economy, society, land, these things are not separated. It's all one thing, you know. Yeah. So, you know, our, our process of inquiry and that that generates the right metaphors, that generates the right um, ritual, um, thought-making, sense-making structures, you know, that we have an impact on the world these are these are good systems these are good patterns good processes you know but they're generalizable you can put your own you know like i don't know a poster is a poster and i don't know you might have a poster of a bikini dude there or you might have a poster of a cat they're both posters it's just someone likes cats and someone likes pecs and abs you know it's um so you got like you know yeah that's two different cultures but it's the same freaking thing it's still a poster same thing you can have a process of inquiry that you know recognizes that everything's in flux everything's in motion yep. and that you're actually in a state of flow with a landscape that is moving and that you can you know do that and you know you might decide that you're gonna have a little i don't know a charity thing for refugees that you're gonna host in your rural community or something 
And that's lovely, but maybe the refugees could help you understand what it is to be a little bit more mobile in your landscape and <laughs> a little more, have a bit more of a temporary understanding of how long you're going to be able to be sedentary in one, st one spot and what it means to move and to yeah. be, on, upon, be on the move. You know, we've got a lot to learn from our refugee and our population here. And yeah, I just, and yes, they can learn from us too, but I just hope they don't learn the wrong things. You know? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, that actually reminded me, something that came up for me in some of my research in the last few months was that question of mobility. Um, and and the um, one of the problems of industrial, one of the many, many, many problems of industrial agriculture is, is its sedentary nature and its fixed nature and that you're going to, you know, you're going to come into um, a paddock and you're going to just root that paddock for years and years and years, you're just going to flog it. And, or you're going to put animals in a feedlot and you're just going to leave them there for a very long time. And there's no chance for that, that country to recover. And one of the things that happens in agroecological systems is a lot of movement. You know, movement is critical. Shifting where things are grown, shifting animals around landscapes, still bounded by fences because these are all on, you know, um, land, uh, lands that people own with fences to, to bound them to show what you own. Um, but within that bounded space, I think mobility is a key feature of small scale farming um, and, and some of the regulatory uh, wins we're having with government to show that what we do is different to industrial agriculture and should be therefore regulated a bit differently is when we highlight the way that mobility leads to healthier land. Um, not just don't just stay in the same place and take everything until it's all gone. Mm. Um, and yeah, and that, that's just it. But but also, I mean, what is it that makes a healthy economy? And it's it's mobility, not stagnation. And that uh, basically at the moment we, with the idea of the accumulation of capital, you know, land, uh, bonds, precious metals, art, um, stocks, you know, um, liquid assets, all, all these sorts of things, you know, um, and you accumulate cash in offshore accounts, you know, you dodge, dodge the tax, you do all that kind of thing, you do derivatives into infinity. I don't know. The idea of the accumulation of vast stores of wealth that must remain stagnant, um, that's death, that's entropy, you know, there's no velocity of any of those dollars in that economy. And that is what a healthy economy is. So at the moment, our economy is shut in Australia. It's like, it's just limping. It's crawling across towards the finishing line on bloody knees for this next financial year coming. Um, but, you know, the stock market's never been healthier. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, the rich, of course, have, have bloody tripled their wealth in the last six months. It's, um, it's huge. It's, uh, the stock market's really healthy. It's not an indicator of economic health. So think about what, what is. It's in your local communities where you've got systems in place that ensure the velocity of the dollar locally. So the idea is how many times can you spend the same dollar <laughs> in your community or in your co-op? And you think about it. So instead of having these supply chains, you know, going out, you know, what if you have these um, supply kind of ecosystems and you've probably, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, you know, you've probably got a co-op here that also feeds into, you know, this thing. And then that gets invested back around into that manufacturing thing locally, which then comes around to the forestry thing, which then comes around, you know what I mean? So if you've got these, you know, interconnected, um, you know, cooperative, um, you know, uh, uh, groups and organizations and businesses uh, all feeding into each other. So when money gets spent in one place, it moves, you know, to the next, and then that place spends it somewhere else. And you find that in your town, the same dollar gets spent like 50 times before it finishes up languishing in a bank account somewhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, and if you think back to, you know, the goods behind that money, then all you're just talking about the circulation of the things we can each produce until everyone has what they need and everyone yeah. has been able to move on what they needed so that they could get what they needed too. Yeah. And if you keep yeah. that local, we all have enough, right? Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, money is just supposed to be something that can track the flows right. of trade and, and sharing, you know, in an economy. That's all currency is supposed to be. And instead, people have turned it into something that they think they need to accumulate. Yeah, well, uh, we, 
we can argue that agriculture we can thank agriculture for that um that's a yeah. <laughs> longer conversation <laughs> but you know there's agriculture and there's agriculture i, I i'm i'm actually I'm, I'm, I'm quite sick of i mean you know uh, i'm sick of all these pseudoscientific things that bloody you know make all these broad sweeping statements about indigenous peoples and paleolithic peoples mm -hmm. i call your ancestors insulted very often like well prior to the invention of agriculture um a third of all deaths were homicides you know where, like what where'd, where'd you get that where'd you get that data is that from the crow magnum bloody church records or what where did you find that data you know that's not very scientific and so that annoys me but then they make equally annoying generalizations about farmers like you know, it's like, I don't know, there's a handful of Vikings, you know, trying to grow some freaking beans in the microclimate of the, you know, that, um, I don't know, that current that goes up. I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> Microclimates along the coast there, out of the shitty rocky soil as the ocean rises and they're trying to figure out where they're going to go and who they're going to have to kill to be able to survive. <laughs> You know, I don't know, it's like they, that, that model of agriculture. Yes, that's what farming is. Farm, because farm is an Anglo-Saxon word, okay? So we're going to call it farming. And it's all about that there where you put the hole in the ground and put the thing and uh, kill everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's farmers and there's farmers. I mean, what do you call a New Guinea farming that was happening like before the Egyptians were doing it, you know? Well, what what you call that one? Is that unsustainable? Is that like making climate change happen? I don't think so. You know, what about what the Aztecs were doing? What about, you know, all over South America where you see those terraces, those permanent things? There's a lot of permanent agriculture been going on all around the world for a very long time. And it's been very sustainable. Yeah. And also lots of um, uh, pastoralism. Pastoralism is a bloody sustainable thing and awesome carbon sink. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, very admirable and very advisable. It also really cuts down the problem of your bushfires and stuff like that. Yeah, um, so, you know, it's basically there, there's been massive, large scale, permanent agricultural and pastoralism going on forever. Quite well. You know, there are some stupid farming techniques, but uh, the generalizations that are made where they lump all farmers in under that, um, and the idea that farming, you know, agriculture has destroyed, you know, agriculture was the start of the lens when everything went wrong and that was the perverse incentives and blah, 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 blah. And so now we have hierarchies because we wanted to grow some beans. You know. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. I reckon, I mean, there's definitely merit in the concern that um, in, I mean, obviously agriculture has been around a lot longer than the sustainability issues that we're faced with now. So to claim that all agriculture was was is the root of all our problems kind of ignores the first 9,000 years of it um, or 9,500 years of it or something. Um, but there's something in the, the problems of surplus of a sedentary society. And, um, and I think, and then of course we know as, as with the rise of capitalist economies, exploiting that surplus um, becomes and the role of the state in protecting surplus. And I think mm. it's kind of the mm. this, this huge example of the neoliberal consequence yeah. of protection of surplus to the to the detriment of its own people. Mm. Uh, and 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 now they're complicit in the maintenance of an economy that's destroying us all. And yeah. you know, in the name of a few. So so I, I, I wouldn't let all agriculture off the hook, but I agree with you. It's no, you wouldn't let all agriculture off the hook, but you yeah. can't just bloody um, you know. You can't just paint everything with the same brush. For sure. And yeah, our farmers yeah. are certainly the yeah. ones trying to, you know, trying Look, to bring, the, the, bring I mean, ecology back into agriculture. The peasantry, you know, has always had all the good TEK, traditional ecological knowledge, you know. And, you know, I mean, British crop rotation, like less than a thousand years, it wasn't that long ago, the crop rotation stuff, genius. Yeah, what's wrong with that? That's yeah. pretty good, isn't it? It is pretty good, but even that's uh, about mobility. I, I know it's, yeah, but I mean, yeah. it, it was a step in the right direction, but it, it was pretty good though, you know, crop rotation. Yeah, you know, so farmers do come up with good ideas and, you know, they figure stuff out eventually. Um, it's, it's, it's just basically this uh, economic system. It's not even an economic system. It's a financial system and people need to understand that. That's what's ruined everything. 
that's what's forced everything into becoming agribusinesses that are, you know, run by just a handful of people on the planet. Mm. And, you know, that's what forces everybody to have to have the same seeds or the same techniques or the, you know, whatever it forces everybody into debt and then everybody's got to drink the roundup and bloody blah, blah, you know, it's a financial system um, that's wrecking everything. It's not agriculture itself. Um, I mean, most farmers would love to uh, produce less and, you know, more diverse crops and really enjoy their time working with the soil, you know, instead of having to kill themselves and the dirt beneath their feet, you know, just to, to cover the interest payments uh, yeah. on, their, on their loans against their land so that they don't lose their farm. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Hey, so I see someone mentioned that podcast with Xavier there. So that was Xavier. I, I, see, I seen, I seen this handsome swarthy fella in there somewhere. Yeah, he's there. And I was like, I know him. There he I is. know him. I done that show with him before. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's a really good one. Um, where I was a lot more articulate than I'm being right now. You know, if you want to like uh, go in and see a bit more detail, <laughs> that we actually had a really good yarn. Um, yeah, those Xavier's One Bite podcasts have been fantastic, actually. Yeah, yeah. You're a very good interviewer, Xavier, and you're running a great podcast. Wonderful. Um, we should actually, I just noticed it's 725. This has gone really oh, good. Okay. And yeah, others yeah. might want to ask you something uh, right. while, while they've got you. So we should probably make that an opportunity. Um, no worries. And I reckon if people want to turn their camera on and just ask rather than putting it in the chat, um, it's nicer to see you and hear your voice and have you participate. So does anyone, I don't know if you want to do the raise hand or literally raise your hand when you turn mm. your, Patrick and Meg are ready to go. Hello, lovelies. Hi, G'day, Tammy. Hi, Tyson. Um, yeah, we, I just wanted to give an example of uh, our kind of neo-peasantry that's happening mm. here on Jarrah people's country. Hey. Um, and um, yeah, so we're farmless farmers. We, we have a herd of goats and geese um, on common land, Jara people, crown land, slash crown land, whatever that means. And we've got, um, we hold bush schools there. We've got 18 neighbours that contribute to the, um, uh, the shepherding or the goat, goat herding. Nice. They're looking out for it. Um, the, the fences are movable. So we just move the, uh, the, the herd through the forest eating down all the blackberries and we take the goats off in spring and summer but all the indigenous biota comes up and then they see uh the indigenous biota seeds and then as soon as at, at this time of the year we've just put the goats back on and then they go through and keep um, doing the ecological weeding and the bushfire mitigation work and so yeah so the the combination of uh neighborhood support doing this guerrilla forestry farming, um, the only way we can do it is relationships with our neighbors. And that is that gives us a social license because we have absolutely zero status on that land. Mm. So I guess a, a way of us to reconnect with our ancestors, our ancestral animals, at the same time, trying to, to deal with a dominant weed species uh, to create more biodiversity and then we eat the surplus male goats as non-monetized um, meat that we also barter and trade for. And our household is like 75% non-monetized now, mm. after 10 years. And it's those sorts of things, running bush schools, teaching kids about it, running gathering spaces. We have a fire circle there where we meet. So is the surplus male goat thing, is that part of your governance uh, for your community as well? Have you, have you gotten rid of all the other males and it's just you and... <laughs> These all your wives here, or what's going on? Are they allowed to speak to? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's a whole lot of. Hey. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, we, and we we have a, a title uh, on a quarter of acre where we're growing a whole lot of food and teaching permaculture, and um, it's all uh, most of it's non-monetary. And um, Meg works two days in the formal economy to pay the mortgage. So, big hats off to you, Meg. <laughs> But um, in order to kind of have this little bit of security and then to um, really increase, uh, I guess, the, the, um, our relationship to land. The, uh, one of the things we did this week was signal out all the saplings that have come up, all the blackwood wattle saplings, which are good medicine, um, traditional medicine uh, 
uh, bark um, and signal them out and then get a whole lot of scrap material from the tip and fence around them so the goats won't eat them down. Mm. They come up and shade out the blackberries. So it's just, a, a, it's a whole, it's taken a long time. It's just- And fix the nitrogen. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, they, they do so much. Yeah, and it's a good cool, pioneer. Cool yeah. Forest as well, blackwood stuff. Yeah. They're fine mitigating. Mm. Um, so it's, yeah, like- And everything else comes up under them over that next 10 years, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a it's a good start for reclaiming land, letting that water come. Yeah. And mm. just to finish, um, now after several years of doing this work, Uncle Rick um, Nelson, who's a Jarrah elder, uh, brought last year, late last year, the, um, the men's business boys over, and we're doing working bees there um, biannually uh, as, a, as an ongoing um, project now with them. So it's just really great to do this work and then to reach out to Mob and share the stories we're doing and and then to start working together as well. So mm. it's, um, you know, it, it's very fragile, but in a way that's that's the beauty of it as well. There's no mortgage, there's no pressure on the land. Um, it's providing an ecological service, a neighborhood service, but also a surplus uh, of, of, of male goats uh, for us for our household economy. Yeah, sweet man, that looks cool. Yeah, it sounds the only problem is that I've only recently watched Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> and I just keep getting like, I just keep thinking about Manson, the Manson cult, and everything. <laughs> You've got all these quiet ladies sitting around with you. No, I, don't know quite. I have a question. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Please say something because I, I keep my no. mind went there and I can't go away from it. Right. We'll just, we'll just change that whole. Uh... <laughs> Yeah. You're having. Um, your term, I can't remember, for being like a special agitator. I'm very interested in this concept. I'm halfway through your book. Stranger, strange attractor. Strange attractor is someone who's created a bit of trouble but is also a deep relational aesthetic, you know, based my life on relationships. Um, I'm curious about that and I, I've read your descriptors of sort of how that works, but... I don't know, I can't really understand how the difference between troublemaking within that, I guess, a bit, and what is this other thing that I'm very grounded in and have done for a long time, which is just essentially, you know, care work mm. and kind of clan work, I guess. Mm. Mm. Not, you know, I don't have any formal way of describing that other than I have four kids and I've got mm. a few people that mm. would you know, die for each other in whatever circumstances came up because you do that, you know, that work. But yeah, that strange attractor, like how do you not be the narcissist troublemaker, but be a good strange attractor yeah. when you're embedded in that work that can almost drown you. You're like, you're there, you're drowning. It's not glamorous. It doesn't yeah. pay, you know. Um, it's funny, but the, the strange attractor work, it's, it's often just something really small yeah. uh, that you do that has a knock on effect, you know. It's about maximizing that. And look, I guess the main thing is just to have those protocols, those operating protocols of making sure that you're interacting with as many other nodes in the system as possible, that you're freely and constantly exchanging energy, information, resources, everything like that. And that you're right across the system, that yeah. you, um, you have some exclusive groups, but also there's some interaction between those exclusive groups and other groups. Um, you know what I mean? And that you're in and amongst, but between lots of different groups. And the most important thing is that when you're in any of those exclusive groups, you remain as different as possible as the people from the people around you who are most similar to you. Because that's the diversity principle in there. Like you, you diversity isn't just about having a few different people from different countries on your board of directors. <laughs> like you have to. <laughs> Yeah, it's not just like, ah, oh, you know, well, I need to, we need to have someone who's not white in, in our barbecue or whatever. That's, that's not diversity. You know, diversity is, you know, in the group of people, like, let's say you're in a women's group, you know, and they're all the same age as you. That's where you need to make sure that you maintain your unique individuality. <laughs> because if you end up looking and sounding like the rest of those women, um, entropy, 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 you never do the strange attractor thing then. And the strange attractor thing, they, they seem to end up in, in, in and around basins of attraction, you know, within a field, you know, w w within a system, 
uh, basin of attraction is where just things just seem to start happening. And, you know, so you sniff those out and you go and hang around and you think, okay, what can I ping into that basin of attraction to actually make some kind of Cambrian change um, occur? And you kind of, oftentimes you just sit there and you follow those protocols and something will happen. What you end up with is a feedback loop, you know, where this, what you put in, you know, goes into the system in, in a kind of closed loop recycles back around and then it changes again as it passes through you and then boom 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 and then that suddenly that ends up spiraling out into you know a big massive change and you think man i barely lifted a finger you know i like wrote one article or i you know <laughs> like what are the what i mean you know books change the world but not as much as tweets do like <laughs> do you know what i mean Sometimes just, the, I mean, that's just this big swirling mass of crap in space, but every now and then one tweet just changes the whole world. And for that moment, that person was a strange attractor and they probably didn't know, you know, what it was that made that tweet, the thing that would change everybody. Mm. Probably nobody really can reverse engineer it, you know, cause it's, and so it's like, you might decide you want to end malaria, right. In, in, in for an African village. And so you're like, you know, um, We'll, we'll, we'll give everybody, you know, a $10 bloody mosquito net. That's it, finished, no more malaria. You come back in six months, there's just as much malaria, you know, but people are eating heaps of fish because they have these deadly fishing nets now, you know, like, <laughs> you know, things change, but not in the way you hoped. Mm. And, you know, and you might think, ah, oh, well, what are we gonna do? And this, all these people dying of sickle cell anemia now, that they're eating the fish and with those people dying of anemia as well as malaria. And so then you think, oh, we'll get them, we'll get CRISPR in here. We'll, we'll, we'll do some gene editing to get rid of sickle cell anemia and then that'll be fine. But then you find out that like, um, you know, if, if it's a dorm, a recessive gene uh, for um, sickle cell anemia, that that makes you pretty much malaria proof. And so in taking away the sickle cell anemia, then everybody actually did die of malaria then. And, and then you're thinking, oh shit, what did I do? And then, you know, the giraffes, something weird starts happening with their necks and you don't know why. <laughs> and that's just, yeah. So, um, you know, not every strange attractor action is a good one, you know, but the more you tinker with complicated stuff, uh, the worse the outcomes are gonna be. But the more you're in a flow within a system, which you all know, cause I can see that looking at your garden, you know, you know what you're doing. You know what edge is, I can see that. You know how to make that work for you. Um, yeah, you, you understand. So yeah, you just keep doing that <laughs> in everything and it'll be there. It's really great though too, Tyson, that I like, I'm glad, thanks for asking the question about the strength, strange attractors, because um, I think that fits again with why we do the solidarity sessions, because we're trying to keep connecting all these autonomous, diverse uh, people, whether they're in organizations or individuals, to keep bouncing off each other with their diversity and, and then amplifying when something good happens um, more quickly because we're actually connected while still being quite autonomous. Yeah. Uh, I think that's that's one of the things us is trying for. Now, Debbie, I think has been waiting to- sure. uh, think uh, Just a last a quick word to that artist family. Look, thank you so much for um, putting up with my, my silly Manson jokes. I just- I enjoy saying silly, cheeky things. Thanks for not taking it personally and getting wild on me. <laughs> All right, next. Hi. Um, thanks so much. And thanks, everybody, for the discussion. It's really cool. Um, Ty, and, and I'm aware that we're way out of time. And I've got mm. a short question that's probably quite a big one. Um, and it's about the relationship between um, Indigenous ways of being in the world and permaculture. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm with the Wallatooka Institute at, in Newcastle. I've been active in the Indigenous academic space for about 20 years. I've also mm. been active in the permaculture space for about 30 years. Um, and to me, there are an awful lot of synergies between living a permaculture life and living um, a life in an in Indigenous yep kind of flow thing it's just but a I, similar similar methodology yeah it it it, it per it, permaculture it, isn't a form of gardening it's a method of inquiry it, absolutely about yeah. rela relationships yeah that's all it is yeah, yeah. You know, and it's and awesome it, and in that and way it's, it's similar to traditional ecological knowledge from 
all over the planet and yeah. it's a constantly shifting evolving body of knowledge too and it, it's never the same in the same place twice and love it yep and it's a method of being in the world mm. um what what i do see and it might um i'm being hesitant about this because i, I know how many ponies are in in this group and um what I do see is not a particularly good articulation or series of discussions. Um, I don't see very many Indigenous people in the permaculture movement, and I see a lot of old white men in the permaculture movement being hailed as gurus, which is, I think, something that's recognised within permaculture as a, um, as, as a, you know, one of our facets um, of the permaculture culture. Um, are there ways of should should indigenous knowledges and permaculture be talking more with each other and are there ways of making that happen or is there stuff happening that i'm just not oh, seeing? look it's there's, there's a because of the nature of permaculture like what we just said before mm -hmm. you know um the lenses that people bring to it are, are very powerful mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and I, I think and it gives a different expression so the place is expressing itself but also the lenses of the people who are in this relationship of co-design with the with their place yeah the non-human entities in that place you know it's uh, quite beautiful so I, I particularly i'm particularly into um uh queer permaculture at the moment yeah, yeah. and the, the people who queer permaculture yeah. and, and yeah. It, there's just some there's some cool stuff going on there yeah, yeah. like just some yeah so I, I um when I connected with that mob, I, I ended up like I was like, oh, you got to come around my house. Like, <laughs> here, look at my bees. Tell me what you think of my bees. Is that the right spot for them? You queer eye my bee, my beehives. <laughs> yeah, no, they they're mad. And there's just you see all kinds of people, you know, mm. all kinds of people doing permaculture and bringing that particular lens to it. You know? Yeah, it's deadly. Um, I don't know many Aboriginal people who are actively doing what they call permaculture but i know many 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 hundreds of aboriginal people who do sheet mulch and yeah, <laughs> yeah. um etc 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 you know who use fire you know to burn yeah. off around their fence and then you know um, and cover that with you know cardboard and then you know almond tree and mango leaves and mm. And then, you know, um, you know, sweep up all the mango seeds and, and coconuts into one spot and then find the ones that are, et cetera, et cetera. Stuff yeah, that looks yeah. like it's pretty much permaculture, but no yeah. one's calling it that. Yeah. yeah. You know, to me. And then there's the dogs all in there. <laughs> the pigs and, you know, there's dugong rib bones just sort mm. of, you know, always around and in the mix and. Um, yeah, somehow the soil just keeps doing what it has to do uh, to make good pawpaws and everybody's happy. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Thank Thanks you so much. Yeah. I said, I'm, I'm conscious that we're over time and people are probably yep. thinking about dinner as well, although I'm sure that they're also happy to listen for another hour if you, mm. if you get to them. I think it's been, um, I know it's been great for me. I feel privileged because um, being in an organization that can ask other other folks doing good work to have conversations, I, I often get to have these conversations and I feel really, really lucky to be able to do so. And I'm looking forward to your next book already. You working on it already, Tyson? I hope so. Um, yeah, sort of, kind of. Yeah, it's it's a lot of yarns I haven't had yet. Um, right. But they're supposed to be, the yarns are supposed to be starting in late February. I've scheduled the first one in and then, yeah. I've still, I mean, I have to make a dugout canoe and I'm only halfway through it. So I have to I do all the carving, ask, all the carving first. Yet, if yeah, you... I, I've started like, I mean, it's too, I don't know why I went big on this one. I think it might be because I've just had no vasectomy. So I feel like a little bit like I need to prove myself. So I'm doing massive carvings now. Um, <laughs> it's just taken too long. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, well, we all look forward to seeing what, what happens next. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I reckon we might, uh, you said to me in a conversation last week that you would possibly be open to another session for our members um, to go a bit deeper into some of the questions around agriculture specifically. Yeah. Uh, so if we can twist your arm and find that little blue spot in your calendar, Sweet. Uh, we'll we might organize that for, for members yeah. in the future sometime. And yeah. 
and I'm really hoping our next session is going to be solidarity session with some folks from Lock the Gate and other organizations doing the good work mm. against extractive industries. So keep your eyes open for this. Um, thanks, Amita, uh, who's there in the background behind the, the AFSA uh, logo, who does all of the work to make the Zoom magic happen. Um, and thanks to Nick for rushing home from a day job to the farm to also get us started here. Um, and just also for your unrelenting work and allyship. It's been great being a yeah. comrade together. But Tyson, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so no much. Worries. I'm just going to leave you with a provocation question that you can all sleep on. Yes. Do, do plants that taste good together always make good companion plants oh. when, when you're planting? Boom. Don't even answer it. That's just to think about because you'll think of a thousand exceptions and it'll be fun. <laughs> All right. I've already got like three, but I'll, okay. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> thanks, Tyson. And thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. See ya. Thank you.